Oh, hello there. Welcome back to my channel. This is a bit of a break from what I usually do. If you're familiar with my channel, you know that I usually upload my entire podcast, which is the Agostino Zinga show onto this channel. And then I cut up some of those um, shows into clips, which I also upload onto this very same channel. Today, I'm going to be reacting to a video that's just been uploaded via Beige Frequency, a very popular um, YouTube documentarian, someone that's been kind of following the whole LA comedy scenes, ups and downs for the best part of maybe two years, maybe a year. I'm not too sure, but I remember seeing his Brendan Shaw um, documentary first, which is what kind of, you know, broke the internet for lack of a better term, where he was essentially calling him out for being a pretty bad stand-up comedian, which isn't his fault. But I feel he made some really good points and really dissected that scene and some of the personalities in it pretty well from an outsider's perspective. Of course, most of the videos got taken down, it got re-uploaded. For a moment, he stopped uploading, but now he's back in full flow and he's blessed us with a video regarding the Brian Callan situation, which I've covered in some detail on my channel. So this is going to be a bit different. I'm just going to be reacting to it. I'm going to play it in its full entirety and we're going to just, um, I'll provide my commentary as we go along. So sit back, grab a drink. I've got my little... Heine here on the side of me, and we're going to get right on in reacting to the Brian Cannon accusations at the end of the fire and the kid via Beige Frequency. Let's go. Let's get in on it. I realize I might be a little late to the party on this story, but as with my Dalia video, I wanted to wait a while to see how these events would play out. And it has by, by the way, I like his sketches. His sketches are always really good. And don't get me wrong, I'm going to stop it a few times. So if you want to watch it in full, I'll put a link down below. Don't get angry at me. I'm going to stop and start because, you know, I'm watching the video for the first time. But I like the sketch that he does in the beginning. This is a pretty funny one to choose, isn't it? Um, Brian Callen post eyelid surgery. And um, this is this this is this maybe signifies maybe it's a good point of using it as a cover image. This probably signifies just how far this podcast has fallen or just how far Brian Callen has fallen, especially in terms of his career that at the age of 50 plus, he decided to get his lids done in an effort to prolong his Hollywood career. And little did he know his Hollywood career was already over before it started. It hasn't been disappointing. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, a few weeks ago, the Los Angeles Times published an article documenting the accusations of several women against Brian Callen. This is the same media outlet that interviewed several of the women who accused Chris D'Elia of grooming them through social media when they were underage. And in an article from July 1st, Amy Kaufman, the same writer who covered the D'Elia accusations, interviewed four more women who accused Brian Callen of sexual misconduct and even assault. As with the accusations made against D'Elia, it is important to say that these are only accusations and there is no hard evidence of them being true. However, the stories these women provided match a long-standing pattern of behavior that has been a part of Callan's persona for years. The and I guess that's the issue, isn't it, right? That's the main crux of the issue. The allegations are frivolous on their own. I guess anybody else could just say whatever they want to say about you. But I guess with every person, you have to take things in context. And regarding, you know, just how Callan talks about how he interacts with women. Again, I think he hams up a bit. It's like he's he's got that he's got that stick he has where he talks about guys and their size and all that sort of stuff. Nothing leads me to believe that he's a homosexual. Do you know what I mean? I'm pretty sure he's a heterosexual guy. And he just loves to kind of play up the idea that he thinks he's a better male and that he hopes to be more alpha and he was born scrawny. It's kind of like his comedic stick, his comedic angle. But some of the salacious and oftentimes harassing stories he said about girls on the podcast has really come to bite him in the arts especially because he kind of purposely said those stories in an effort to not sound like a gentleman right it was anti-gentleman it was sort of like okay i'm gonna be the most sleazy scummiest bag scumbag i can be talking about these women um just so like, I can represent maybe the other side of attraction or something. I don't know what it was. I'm trying to even rationalize it in my head. It doesn't really make, make sense, but it's really come to bite him in the back because I think anybody else who's just a standard comedian, if this, again, God forbid, but if this same accusation happened to somebody like a Burt Kreischer, there'd be no real, for, you know, there wouldn't be that much uproar about it because there's hardly any, there's any, hardly any track record of him being a womanizer or talking really um disrespectfully about up and coming female comedians or about sexual interactions had in the past you don't really hear those stories if anything you know you'd probably give birth the benefit of doubt but because it's brian callan unfortunately you know and then i guess to the crystalia stuff because he's such a straight edge dude and for the most part he didn't really speak about girls i don't know i only started watching congratulations towards the end but like just before he ended it 
But from what I can remember, Chris was never really, he never really spoke that much about the girls he hooked up with. And um, he kind of kept that on a DL. Um, you kind of got an assumption that obviously he was, you know, a, you know, he was, um, girls were attracted to him. Girls did think he was attractive, but you never actually got the idea that he was a woman. As so when the stories about him came out, it's even more devastating because, you know, you knew there was something dark in his cupboards because, you know, being straight edge and having no vices whatsoever, there's, you're bound to get up to some other stuff and when no one's looking. The tamest of the allegations came from a woman named Claire Ganshirt, who was involved in a years-long extramarital affair with Brian Callan. In addition to mentioning Callan's extreme and aggressive energy, Ganshirt claimed that on one occasion, Brian told her that women have a biological and primal desire to be raped. And the music Not too. a good start, oh, but the stories only escalate from here. Oh, God damn it. Rachel Green, an employee of an American apparel store, claimed that in 2009, Callan pinned her against a wall while wearing a Speedo and started kissing her neck until she pushed him away and ran downstairs. A story that was corroborated by one of Green's co-workers. And again... And this is a story that I mentioned before in my, one of my shows. Sorry, I know it's only a minute in and I'll keep pausing it, but please bear with me. But this is the issue Brian Callan has. Let's say, for instance, you can disprove or, you know, it's not... I guess some people have said to me in the comments that it's not, it's not, um, it's not, Brian, it's not Brian's place to prove his innocence it's up to the lady in question to prove his guilt, right? Okay, no problem. But if you want to work again in Hollywood, he's going to have to prove his innocence. That's the fact of the matter. In a court of law, maybe that's right. But if he wants to work again in Hollywood, he's going to have to prove unequivocally it didn't happen. Um, or it didn't happen the way that she said. In a similar to the Chris Hardwick story, right? Chris Hardwick's girlfriend comes out and says he's been mentally and physically abusive. He basically disproves it. And then he's welcomed back into the industry with open arms. He didn't have to do that because he knows the truth. But in order to get back and to work again, he has to do that, right? But the issue with Callan is that he can disprove the rape, possibly. He can maybe disprove the account of um, the lady that said, oh, she um, she wanted to borrow some money and he said, no, uh, give me a blowjob instead, right? He could disprove those stories. But this story about the girl in, in the Urban Outfitters or whatever it is, um, that's a really damaging one because that sounds like a story that would be true if you know brian and you're familiar with him on a podcast they, there could be some truth to that and also it's a story that's hard to disprove like what are you gonna say is you gonna say that she was coming on to him she, she she could easily argue that no i wasn't i was you know i own commission i'm a sales assistant that's how i get paid i have to like you know make you feel well welcomed and make you feel at ease and, and be friendly with you and maybe even you know extend some flirtatious uh vibes your way but it didn't give an invitation to people who won't kiss me so that's a story that is going to be the most difficult to disprove because that sounds like a pretty textbook sexual harassment case where he quite clearly read the signals way wrong. And instead, like normal dudes, right? A normal guy would have maybe, I don't know, tried to speak to her, maybe try to get her number, maybe offer to take her out on a date. And then you would have met with a door shut in it. And she would have said, no, I'm not interested. But to go from like trying to flirt with somebody in a change room, coming out of speedo, which is already indecent exposure in some ways, and then pinning that person on the wall who you don't know and trying to kiss them in hopes they're going to kiss you back. It's a risky game to play. You know what I mean? You're really rolling the dice on that one. And while I can't attest to the veracity of this accusation, it's something I could see a guy like Callan doing. In the past, such as during a podcast with Chael Sonnen, he has gone into detail about how aggressive he can be with women, oh. going so far as to say that even when women have told him no and physically stopped him from touching them, he keeps going and tries to break the walls down. The full quote, I've been making out with a woman before and I've gone down. I've gone to places and had her take my hand and go, no. I go, okay, not tonight. Or by the way, give me a couple more minutes of kissing and moving around and I'm going to break these walls down. <laughs> no, don't get me wrong. This is not good because obviously this is taken out of context. When you write, when you write like um, banter down that you're having with, with boys, you know, you write it down, you know, in text form, it does come across a bit harsh and it does come across a bit gross and a bit creepy. I'm sure there's some context to it, but as it is in context of what we're talking about, woohoo! Now, a knack that he considers just being a man. There is also the accusation of Tiffany King. In 2017, King was going through a divorce and some financial hardships. During this time, she approached Callan, who she considered to be a friend, and asked if he could help her out. Callan declined, but took King and his opener out to dinner. During the ride home from the restaurant, King claims that Callan offered her money and stage time in exchange for a blowjob. Of course, this is just an accusation. Curiously enough, King's accusation also bears a striking resemblance to a story that Whitney Cummings told about Brian Callan. 
During one of her appearances on The Fighter and the Kid, Cummings laughed off the many times Brian had sexually harassed her, such as an instance where Brian exposed himself to Whitney while getting a ride from her, which Brian attributed to an attempt to get a blowjob. Huh. Trying to- Now, that's the issue. The issue with that Whitney story, right? again, it's only two minutes in, a, a bit, bear with me for pausing again. The issue that he has with all this is that that story could possibly be disproved. If you if you agreed what I think Stevie Blue Eye said in the podcast the other day, because I think he, he was the opener that was with Callan, that story, you know. So he could disprove that by just, you know, get, you know, corroborate, you know, you can get the account of his friend who was in the car at the time and she, he could argue, no, I was in the car. Um, we dropped her off first and then we went home, right? And maybe they, he can get receipts that prove that they were together, blah, blah, blah. Something could, you know, there's something there that they, you could disprove. The issue is that, that story sounds eerily similar to what he was told us, you know, prior about Whitney Cummings, right? And she even brought it up and he quite, he looked quite sheepish. I remember the first time watching it, he was a bit, he felt a bit uncomfortable when she told the story, but of course she was being a bit of a lad. This is when Whitney Cummings was, you know, one of the boys. Now she's, you know, she's in Amy Schumer territory. She decided, she's kind of decided to go Hollywood route, which is, you know, it's everyone's prerogative. Do what you have to do. You have to keep the lights on. But when she was one of the boys, she kind of made it made him feel at ease by making a joke out of it. But at the time, it didn't sound like the best story in the world. And then again, fast forward to these allegations. You get a blowjob from a female comedian in her car. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Jesus Moments Christ. later in the conversation, Whitney described Brian as somebody who doesn't listen to the word no or take it seriously, to which Brian sarcastically said he was a rapist. Cummings then explained that early in her friendship with Callan, she believed she would have to have sex with Callan because he wasn't going to take no for an answer. I'm sure people will deflect this kind of behavior as comedians exaggerating or lying for the sake of comedy, but Whitney was the first person to distance herself from Callan by deleting episodes of her podcast featuring Callan well before he had been accused of anything. It really gets the old noggin jogging. I don't think I don't think that's much to read into that. I just think she was doing damage limitation. I think Whitney Cummins, if you're familiar with her on podcasts and stuff and how she kind of portrays herself, she does seem like a bit of a nervous, frantic wreck, in a, not in a bad way, but like, you know, she's got that kind of um, uh, energy about her. So I'm sure she's always thinking about the worst case scenario in every situation, regardless of what she's in. That's probably part of why it makes her a bit of a genius in terms of writing shows. But I'm sure when the stories were going around or when Amy Kaufman was doing her, her due diligence as a journalist and calling up different people and trying to get their side of the story before the story broke, she got word of it and just decided to just cut both of those guys out. She didn't even want to try and attempt to dance, you know, to kind of, you know, defend um, another, whatever. She just didn't want anything to do with it or whatever. She decided, no, I don't want this mess. I just want to keep my career. I want to be a Hollywood darling and continue doing what I'm doing. So she has to throw her friends out on the bus, just delete them. So I don't think it was anything super malicious. I just think she was worried about losing her own position in Hollywood. The most severe accusations, though, came from a woman named Catherine Fiore Tigerman. An actress and fellow Mad TV cast member, Tigerman claims to have known Gallen since 1994. Tigerman moved to LA in 1999, where she met up with Callan again, and they became friends. After Tigerman landed a role in a TV pilot, Callan took her out to dinner, which Callan has confirmed. However, they have two very different stories about what transpired that night. Tigerman's story is a bit long, so I suggest you read the entire LA Times article. But to make a long story short, she claims that after having dinner with Callan, he wanted to see a movie, and then drove back to his house to look up showtimes. <laughs> According to Tigerman, she used the bathroom at Callan's place, and when she was done, he was waiting for her in the doorway, oh, at which Jesus point she Christ. claims Callan pushed her down onto his bed and started touching her against her will. She repeats- what's, what's with these guys and this doorway stuff and being in robes and pushing people? Sometimes I, like part of this, part of the issue with this whole escapade and this whole scandal is that he's bringing that kind of, again, allegedly, if this is true, we don't know if it's true, allegedly. If this is true, or allegedly, from what's been, you know, alleged, let's say that, it's the idea that you could think you have the right to bring that kind of sexual energy to every girl you come across. It's just disgusting. It just doesn't have, it just doesn't make any sense, right? You sort of, you would imagine that you would have to find somebody that kind of appreciates that kind of energy or that wants to be um, courted that way. Or somebody that you maybe develop a relationship with and you get comfortable enough to be like, hey, this is something that I enjoy. Do you enjoy it? And you kind of bounce off each other. But to just assume that everybody likes that, it's just insane. It's the same way that it's, it's, it's the same way if you would assumed 
if you were to assume that every female or every woman you come across in your life that you try to uh, get into a romantic relationship with, that they wanted someone that was going to be polite and meek and really submissive. No, you have to kind of um, uh, calibrate your energy depending on who you're meeting at the time. Again, this is only if you're hooking up. If you want to get a relationship with somebody, of course, try and meet somebody that, you know, is your yin to your yang or whatever it may be. But if you're trying to hook up with somebody, you're trying your best to like convince them that you're a decent person, that you're, you know, a safe person to hang out with. That's probably what I'd imagine if you're on the prowl. The last thing you want to do is go straight for broke and start pinning people up against the wall, coming out half naked, shoving your tongue down their face. You'd want to kind of calibrate stuff. You know what I mean? Unless again, unless you're both high and drunk, then, you know, whatever, all sort of common sense out the window because you it's hard to kind of judge have any kind of spatial awareness, any kind of emotive awareness, right? It's hard to, that's why a lot of those pickup artists, guys, even though they're creeps, they have a really good point about when you go and try and pick up girls or if you try and go and get some numbers, you should do it sober. You shouldn't drink or anything, no smoking or nothing. Go completely sober so that you are, um, you have that kind of awareness, right? Your emotions aren't dulled or, or anything, right? You don't kind of like, you can kind of read people a bit better when you're sober too. Don't get me wrong. It's a bit counterintuitive and maybe it's a bit predatorish going outside to hook up with drunk girls while you're sober. But the point remains, you know, having your um, faculties is probably the best way to go about things. Immediately told him no, but thinking she couldn't physically escape, she stopped pleading with him. When it was all over, Tigerman started crying, to which she claims Callan responded with, Aw, oh, come on, what am I? A big bad rapist? Oh, I'm not a big bad rapist. Brian. Come on, you're gonna be my girlfriend now. Brian. We need to get this out of the way. I know that sounds a bit over the top, but I can 100% picture Brian saying the sentence. You know, in that annoying, overly affected voice he does. Yeah, exactly. I would have tried to do it, but I can't do impressions. I'm just terrible at him, so you'll have to picture it in your mind. Oh, am I a big bad rapist? Come on. I don't know how he talks, actually. I'm a Callan has of course denied these allegations and said that his sexual encounter with Tigerman was consensual. On the other hand, Tigerman did tell a friend and her then boyfriend about her experience with Callan and both corroborated the nature of her allegations. However, she did not attempt to pursue any legal action against Callan, preferring to try to move on with her life. As such, there are going to be people who dismiss the accusations out of hand and argue that Tigerman is trying to ruin Brian Callan's life because she regrets cheating on her ex-boyfriend 20 years ago, or something of that nature. I understand that false accusations are made, and I think it's fair to be skeptical about anonymous accusations posted on social media. And unfortunately, like many issues involving sexual assault, this is largely a he said, she said situation with no physical evidence either way. But when somebody goes public and puts their story out there with nothing to gain, and multiple people backing them up, I have a hard time dismissing them completely. With That's a good point, especially because I, I never remember too. A couple of those stories have been corroborated by friends who were told at the time that it happened, right? The girl in the shop, um, this young lady at the end. <sighs> With all that said, the shit show that followed the Brian Callan accusations has been a bizarre roller coaster ride of insanity. <laughs> In the immediate aftermath of the LA Times article, Brian Callan tweeted a message to his fans, in which he denied the accusations, blamed them on cancel culture, and stated that he would be releasing an emergency Saturday night edition of his podcast. And this is where the speculation started, because the emergency episode of TFHEK that Callan promised never materialized. Furthermore, a few days later, Brian posted a video message to his fans on Instagram addressing the accusations. There are a lot of interesting aspects of this video, but one that I think is worth noting in particular is how nervous Callan appears to be. <laughs> the entire time he's speaking, his eyes are darting around in what can only be described as animal panic, and his mouth is forced into the rictus grin of a primate fear response. During the video, Brian makes several odd statements, such as saying he's ignoring the advice of those around him to lay low, or wait for the news cycle to pass. He also walked back his claim from Twitter that the accusations were related to cancel culture or the Me Too movement. In fact, he even stated that he believed the Me Too movement was one of the most important movements of his lifetime. Ah, ha, ha. And if you watch anything of the T-Fight K, you know how you'll know how ludicrous that statement is. Brian used to get this is probably one of the other things a bit of a uh, a bit of a this kind of um. This may be uh, was a sign of what was to come. Whenever something would come up regarding some sort of, you know, cancel culture, Me Too thing, right? He'd get overly defensive. Now, don't get me wrong. 
I've got my issues with cancel culture, right? The people that say cancel culture doesn't exist is you know they're Looney Tunes, right? It obviously does exist, but there are some occasions where if you're unable to get retribution via the courts, then your only option is to go via the cancel culture route. But it does exist, right? Sometimes it can go awry, it can go too far. Some people can innocent people can you know um, sometimes lose their livelihood, lose their families. Bad stuff can happen. If you if you've read um. Uh, if you read Mark Ronson's book, so you've been publicly shamed, you'll know how the the kind of the ills of cancer culture. But Brian used to get really defensive, so defensive that you sometimes thought, like, what have you got in your what skeletons do you have in your wardrobe? Like, what skeletons? Because he just didn't make any sense. Every story that pertains to cancer culture, he'd always try and explain it away, always try and rationalize it some way, make some comment about the complexities of male and female uh, relationships and all this sort of stuff. And I'm just like, what are you talking about? You Sometimes it's, it's better just to say nothing, right? But I guess if you have a podcast, you want to open your mouth and give your opinion on anything, you know, case in point. But I think that was definitely a warning sign of what's to come. Which is pretty hilarious. If you've ever listened to Brian oh, and see? Brendan mock Terry Crews for, as they put it, snitching on somebody uh... who inappropriately touched him. The most interesting part of Callan's Instagram video came when he stated he would be taking a leave of absence from his podcast. This reversal of position, combined with the fact that Brian never delivered the emergency Saturday night podcast, has led some people to believe that Brendan Schaub shot the idea down. This speculation was later furthered by a few pieces of circumstantial evidence. The first being the removal of Brian Callan's name from the description of the Uh Fire Weekend podcast. Even though Brian stated he was taking a leave of absence from the podcast, removing his name seemed a bit extreme. Exactly. Another interesting tidbit came during an episode of TFATK co-hosted by Josh Wolf. During the opening of the episode, Brendan talked about the situation with Brian and made a few very peculiar comments. The one that really stands out to me was when Brendan said that the fighter and the kid was his baby and he's never missed an episode. Now the issue, I guess, I've I had an issue too with the removal on the description or the or uh, of the podcast. I thought that was a bit of a scummy move. I think again, it's weird because I it's it's hard to say this out loud because it, I'm not in that position. But there is a part of me that thinks if you're you know they made this podcast together, right? It's no good without either of them. They have to have they have to be with each other to make it work. I think even Callan on his own couldn't sustain this podcast and make it a thing. I think he needs to have a co host such as Brendan to get the job done. He's the one that turns up. He's the one that's got the business mind. He's the one that's able to kind of get the shows out consistently, regardless of what you think of him as a comedian, you can't deny that together they're better than they are on their own. But there's a part of me that thinks if they founded it together and some one or the other is going through some sort of public issue um, they should really stick together and if they end up kind of falling together and, it, and and you know and things go to complete shit or complete zero which it probably wouldn't then it is what it is that's a that's a kind of pact that you've got into by doing a podcast together with somebody the idea that you can start a podcast as a two and then somehow someone gets in trouble or something happens to them and you just continue on doesn't make any sense it kind of goes against everything that kind of your fans are used to when it comes to presenting a show so i think that was number one maybe the bad even again it might not be their fault if you look to the description on the screenshot it said cast media now they didn't they never mentioned to the fans oh hey we signed to cast media and again it's not their prerogative they don't need to explain anything to anybody but i think if there was an explanation around why they decided to sign to such a, a production company i think they are i don't know what they actually do but maybe they handle merchandise and sponsors whatever they do right if if they signed up to cast media they should have maybe explained that prior so that if this occasion would have transpired people would have known or you could have either just pointed to the big bad wolf and said hey it's the it's the people above cast media said i can't have him on a show do you know what i mean it's an easy sort of deflection but because they get this impression that they were independent and they were kind of sticking a middle finger up to Hollywood and doing it on their own and they've got no bosses and Brendan did that kind of crappy joke he always does about, oh, let me ask the boss, knock, knock. Yeah, he says, all right, that sort of shit, right? Because they gave that impression that they were their own men, that they kind of, you know, they were the ones that sort of, um, they the ones that kind of determined their own destiny. For somehow, for, for, for a serious issue such as this, right, where you actually need your own platform to kind of... Um, you know, uh, shape your own narrative, defend yourself, provide you, you know, give yourself a, a source of income, regardless of what it may be. He can't do it. 
This is demonstrably false. In fact, the most viewed episode of the podcast on YouTube is an episode without Brendan. Moreover, the comments seem show really too. unnecessary to mention when Brendan is supposedly trying to defend his friend, and exactly. it indicates to me that there might be a more serious rift growing between them than they're letting on. But Maybe. Brendan did defend Brian, which is more than you can say about almost anyone in his circle. Maybe. I don't think there's a rift personally. I don't think there's, they've got any beef. Um, and I don't even think Brendan's the one that shut it down. I honestly do think... Um, uh, cast media either got involved or one of Brendan's Brian's friends because even I said at the moment at the time it happened I thought Brian doing a special emergency emergency broadcast would have been stupid I think the smartest thing Brian's done in this whole in this whole scandal he didn't record that emergency podcast right after the allegations dropped because I'm sure he would have said something stupid and incriminating and got himself into more trouble he didn't let Brendan go on the TFAK and say anything about the issue either because again if you know Brendan he has no he has no filter in the worst way. He's not able to kind of form sentences or to form an argument in a coherent fashion. It's not his fault. He might have some, you know, some issues in that regard. But regardless, he's not the best person to kind of speak about those kind of things. And again, he has this weird hang up about counterculture. They've come off the back of catching COVID and getting a lot of public backlash. So he's really defensive when it comes to anything concerning people calling him out, blah, 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 blah. That's probably the best option they did. They, they did not releasing that special podcast and not giving Brendan Carter Blanche to go out and defend him quote unquote because you could have got in more trouble even more so than with the crystal lee accusations comedians have been eerily quiet in regards to brian callan indeed a fact that is pretty poetic when you remember how readily callan distanced himself from crystal but brian's weak attempt to acknowledge the crystal lee accusations has been more than brian has received from his own friends notably joe rogan's omerta like silence on the accusations made against delia and callan has been quite peculiar with Delia, you can potentially make the argument that he wasn't a close part of Rogan's circle. However, Rogan has known Brian Callan for 25 years and referred to him as being like a brother. More importantly, Joe has mentioned Brian's debauchery on multiple occasions. Like the time he gleefully brought up Callan's involvement in a weird, anonymous, eyes wide shut style orgy. Or when he told Eric Weinstein the story of setting his ex-girlfriend up with Brian, only to have her angrily call him back to say that Brian came in her without consent. Yeah, the, the Joe Rogan silence is really strange. I've I've kind of noticed that too. Um, again, it's it's odd because I think in general, I don't know. I think in general, if you listen to enough Joe Rogan, you know that anything concerning his friends, he just doesn't talk about in public unless someone brings it up on his show. I think he's not that he's not a, he's not a bad guy in that he won't tell you not to bring it up. But sometimes if people are going through stuff and someone brings it up by accident, he'll just talk about it. But he won't go out of his way to mention it, which I think is admirable because I think behind the scenes, much like his um charity which people have mentioned a few times he helps people out with money with opportunities he never he never mentions it or kind of talks about it with a person even when they come on his show after the fact i think he's just a generally good friend in that regard he's not he doesn't want to pile on but the issue is in this kind of hollywoody kind of weird front-facing world the fact that he's not defending him probably does brian callamore a disservice then it does him uh, advance it, does, it, it, you know I mean? it doesn't really give him it doesn't really work for him in that regard he probably needs some of his friends to step up and say something about him but again if you're joe rogan do you really want to risk your career for something that brian callum might have done anyway because you might think he might not have done it because again you don't know what your friends get up to behind closed doors you don't know what they get up to when they're not around you you can't really vouch for anybody apart from yourself really right maybe your family to some extent but even your family you, you're never to know what people are really like um when they're not around you it's like that kind of um, quintessential. Everyone's got that person, right? That friend in your group who has another close friend or someone that they work with who you absolutely detest. But, you know, around your friend, they seem to be cool. But when they get around you, you, you know, something else comes out of them. So I'm sure it's a similar sort of thing there. But I don't know, man. I don't, And again, I don't know what Brandon, Joe Rogan could say. Of course, he's got a big platform. He could give Brian Callum an opportunity to defend himself. But I think it would, in all these years, if you listen to Joe Rogan, They've been trying to cancel him, right? Whoever's whoever they are, they've been trying to cancel him, take him down for years. He's built up enough of a fortress of cash reserves in order to be uncancelable. He's got enough of a loyal fan base that no matter what people say, it's never going to dissuade anybody. But you don't need the hassle. You don't need the extra eyes on you. You don't need people going over your episodes, taking things out of context, sharing things. You don't need all that hassle. It's not it's unnecessary. And it also will affect his his ability to get new guests on. So there's so much noise involved there. And again, it's just considering the people that are involved i just wouldn't if it was me even if they're my friends i'm, I'm definitely going to support you 
um, behind closed doors. Again, if only if you're Joe Rogan, if you're somebody else, I think they should say something. I think the Whitney Cummins and stuff throwing him under the bus, you know, you've got no excuses there. But if you're Joe Rogan, you're probably it's probably um, you're probably best served to protect whatever you have, so that when he comes back and when he's allowed back into the fold, if he's able to, you know, uh, prove his innocence then you're, you've got a ready-made platform to, to come back to and speak about his issues that he's going through, right? It's similar to the Louis C.K., right? Luke, when Actually, that being said, didn't Joe Rogan defend Louis C.K.? He did, didn't he? Yeah, it's odd. I don't know, man. I, I really don't know why he's not talking about it. It's, and you can't really explain it that way. Dicey, dicey. As I've watched this story develop, one of the biggest questions I've been contemplating is whether or not Rogan will even address this situation. At this point, enough time has passed, and he's missed so many opportunities to speak on the situation, that it seems safe to assume that Joe will give Brian the Chris Benoit treatment and act like he never existed. <laughs> it doesn't appear that Callum will make this task easy for Rogan though, because Brian is committed to this idea of not laying low. Fortunately for the sake of unintentional comedy, he's doing it in the most embarrassing way possible. Indeed. This is where we come to the part of the story that is still ongoing and may change by the time the video is released. After Brian took his leave of absence from the fighter and the kid, Brendan attempted a brief run without him. Unsurprisingly, episodes with Brendan and a co-host were met with increasingly negative feedback. So, on August 12th, Brendan and Brian announced that they would be releasing episodes of The Fighter and the Kid from behind a paywall on Patreon. Strangely, the Instagram post announcing their move to Patreon was deleted shortly after it was posted. Much like Brian's tweet mentioning an emergency Saturday night episode of The Fighter and the Kid, this deleted post was a cause of much speculation. What I imagine happened was that Brendan and Brian thought they could just do additional episodes of the podcast behind a paywall. But these dummies didn't bother to run that idea by their partners or sponsors. Should ask daddy for permission? I came to this conclusion because when contacted by the LA Times, Cast Media, the company that represented the fighter and the kid, stated that they were no longer working with Brian Callen. So these two did the most logical thing anyone would do in this situation. They created a new show called The Fighter in the Rinks and put it on Patreon. I'm not kidding. I'd almost feel for Callum. You know, if he wasn't an avaristic ghoul who was willing to put people's lives at risk by doing stand-up comedy during a pandemic. But Jesus, this is embarrassing. Imagine being so cucked that not only do you let this bandana-wearing lummox do your podcast without you and pocket all of the sponsorship money, but you also change the name of your show so you can continue riding his coattails for some shekels on Patreon. When you realize how green I don't think that's fair. Again, I, I don't I don't know what we know behind the scenes. I'm pretty sure Brian is probably so Brennan is definitely cutting him some money. I don't think he's just keeping the money for himself or maybe divvying up with the co host that comes on the show. But I'm sure I'm pretty sure especially considering their friendship and considering what Brian's done for him in his career. Because I think if that wasn't the case, we definitely would have known something would be amiss, something would have been said. But I think Brendan knows that if he was to do something like that, he'd definitely get us communicated from his community of comedian friends. And the last thing he wants is to kind of be, you know, kicked off that, you know, kicked out of that circle of uh, LA comedy store comics and stuff. He doesn't want to do that. So I'm sure he's definitely helping him out with the money. There's, there, there's no way. I don't believe that's true. Greedy these two are, it's no surprise that Callan is already doing the right wing grifter routine. The day after the creation of The Fighter and the Rinks, Callan appeared on Louder with Crowder to peddle the same tired uh, bullshit we hear yeah. from every intellectual dark web wannabe. He whined about cancel culture and the lack of due process for people accused of sexual misconduct, but he was also careful not to say exactly why he was being forced to reprise his podcast behind a paywall. He wants people to believe that he's being silenced or deplatformed, but that isn't the case. In the past I've made a few videos where I've taken a stance against cancel culture and deplatforming, but this isn't what is happening with Callan. He hasn't been kicked off SNL like Shane Gillis, nobody has tried to excommunicate him from comedy as they did with Louis C.K., he hasn't had any of his accounts banned or his livelihood taken away. What happened was, the sponsors don't want to be associated with a guy accused of sexual misconduct, and cast media probably told Callan to pound sand. While I disagree with- No, I, I think he's definitely been cancelled, for sure. With these allegations in the in the air, I disagree with that. With these, Caleb, with these allegations, um. Um, above his head he's definitely been cancelled 100% like he's probably not going to be able to do shows at regular stand-up clubs when they reopen unless he puts them on himself no one's going to want to go on a lineup with him I'm sure some female comics are going to do that whole like standing in solidarity with these women thing and not go on the lineup with him 
Because imagine if Lucy K got the remember, remember Lucy K went went up on to do a stand up show, and the women in there were freaking out. And, you know, his allegations were, you know, probably 5% of what Callan did. You know what I mean? He's been accused of legitimately raping somebody. These aren't kind of like, this isn't somebody that kind of maybe did something questionable in a, in a sexual encounter, right? That he probably didn't read the signals right off. No, this is like somebody being accused of unwanted sexual advances um, to the highest degree. So he's definitely been cancelled, I'm sure. Like, he's, you know, Netflix show that he did with Delia's gone stand up specials wherever he's going to put it everywhere else I'm pretty sure that's kind of tainted his possibility to, to put them on great platforms um he can't go in his own friend shows like it's a big deal he can't do his own podcast that's that's definition of cancelled no with that decision from an ethical standpoint it's just the way the free market works and it's the same thing Brian did when Delia was accused True. Callan can complain until he's blue in the face about no one sticking up for the accused because they don't want to be cancelled too but what did he do when his friend of 15 years was accused? He wasn't out there in the streets defending Delia's reputation he pretended they never toured together and then deleted any trace of their friendship from his social media like a coward that's what I was saying. Thank God he mentioned this. This is the issue with this again. Okay? Do you know what I'm saying? If you don't stand up for your friends, eventually when a mob comes after you, you will have no one to stand up for yourself or stand up for you, right? That's where he fucked up, I assume. Because the thing that makes it even more funnier and makes it even more, um, what you call it? Uh, you know, uh, yeah, well, it doesn't make it funny if you're a Brian, but the thing that really makes it hilarious is that I'm pretty sure when Amy Coffin was, um, specking his story out and doing her journalistic due, due diligence and calling people up and giving them a heads up and asking for comment. I'm sure the Crystalia story was in tandem with the Brian Cannon story. Because if you remember back in the day, a few weeks ago, um, Joey, Joey Diaz on his podcast, Church What's Happening Right Now, and said, Oh, I've heard of journalists calling up various comedy clubs trying to get gossip or trying to get um, salacious stories about certain LA comics so that they can bring that whole comedy store click down. That's what he was basically talking about, like the Delia. And I think this is maybe in the midst of the Delia story that there was a big takedown piece in the works that people, some people were working on. So if that's true, I'm sure every other agent, especially if you're signed to CAA or WME, these guys are like, you know, these guys and girls are literally part of the fabric of LA, right? They've got people on the street. They've got their little, um, they've got their little uh, spies everywhere that are listening to all the conversations. They get word, they get heads up on certain things. I'm sure they would have known that something was rumbling, but pretty sure in Brian Callan's arrogance or in his kind of obliviousness and maybe, you know, him thinking he's completely innocent, he decided not to even kind of try to uh, get in front of it by standing up to his friend, standing up for his friend. He thought he could distance himself from Chris Delia in the hopes that when the allegations came out about him, he could somehow be frank innocence. But no, that's not how it works out. And now look, if you would have been, if you would have made more of an effort to stick next to Chris, imagine how more powerful they could have been together trying to combat it, this cancel culture that they're supposedly saying is uh, trying to take them down. They would have been in a far better position to do so. But because, number one, they, um, they find the kids signed their rights away or signed away the kind of um, autonomy and authority they have on their podcast and cast media in the hopes of getting another check. Because again, don't think it's about money. It's all about money. They signed their, they got a big check. They got a big advance or whatever it may be or they got some assistance in making merch making the life easier. But then when when the um, scandal hit, when they hit a bit of a road bump, when they need some assistance, they need their platform to go and speak openly about issues, to kind of stand in solidarity with their friend, Cast Media said, nope, pull the plug. Perfect justice. That comes back to the heart of the issue I brought up in my video about the Crystal Lee accusations. I said that incident could spell the death of the circle of comedians that has grown up around Joe Rogan. And I think we're seeing that schism manifest itself now. If you're familiar with the origins of all these people, you'll know that most of them are cowardly opportunists who only work together because they were able to form a group that exerted a tremendous amount of control over the comedy scene around them. They're Boom! You know who I think about soon this whole thing? I think about, I wonder what Aisling B thinks about all the situation. Do you remember Aisling B, the girl that was on Burt Kreischer's podcast who was kind of trashing the comedy scene or the comedy, uh, the LA comedy store, talking about how clicky it is, talking about how it's a patriarchy, uh, talking about how it's a boys club and they don't let new people in, especially women, like really, really trashing it. And Burt had to kind of like stand up for his friends. And it was really kind of an uncomfortable podcast because, you know, Bert's not, Bert's kind of like a lovable drunk. So to see him being combative with a young lady like that was really weird. <coughs> but she made some pretty decent points. Now looking back on it, especially with these allegations, you're like, 
She might have had a point, man. She might have had a point. Often viewed as the antithesis of the New York comedy scene, because they've tried to portray their clique as working together instead of tearing each other down. The difference is, the comedians who shit on each other at the back table of the comedy cellar were actually friends. The crew that orbits Rogan only pretended to be friends because the relationship is politically convenient. Exactly. But but the issue is, again, the issue is that's really funny about this is that they always trash the LA comedy, the New York comedy scene, or the LA, yeah, LA guys trash the New York comedy scene for being too, um, you know, uh, for being too, what, rude, I guess. They diss each other, they're mean, they don't work together, there's a lot of haters, blah, 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 whatever it may be. What I actually think is the case is that I think there's just, there's probably a, an abundance of loser mentality in New York where if you're not getting spots, for sure you're going to be looking at the next man or girl and saying, hey, they shouldn't get spots, they're crap, I should be there. You know, that kind of comparison sort of stuff, right? I'm sure that's the case. But at least I think they're, they're very aware of who, what they are and who they are. There's no like, um, they don't fool themselves into thinking that they're being constructive with their criticism. They know it's hate. They know that they're hating at that. Per they're hating that person for getting that writing gig, for getting that spot on the late night TV show. They're hating for sure, and they're proud of it. They have little circles and clicks that they kind of complain with. They complain to. Uh, they text people. Um, they gossip. You know, um, in the back in the back alleys of these bloody comedy clubs, it's pretty um, open who they like and who they don't like. Right, for sure. But the issue with the LA comedy scene, guys, is that they try and pretend like they're somehow better than these guys, like, like, they're, like they're somehow more altruistic and whatever it may be. But they're not really, because essentially they're only friends with each other because they're all they're all kind of passing the comedy store, right? The people that aren't passing the comedy store, you don't really see them around those guys that often unless they're openers or they're taking a road. There's obviously a bit of a hierarchy. There's definitely a bit of a clique. There's definitely a bit of a boys' club, right? For sure. So I'm sure, like that kind of relationship is only going to breed boot lickers and ass lickers really for the most part. So it's going to breed any kind of real honesty in the scene, isn't it? When push comes to shove, we've seen how willing they are to throw one of their own under the bus. Just think about it like this. Callan had to Skype into Louder with Crowder instead of going on the biggest podcast in the world, hosted by his friend of two and a half decades. Exactly. Rogan had Alex Jones and racist, self-professed pedophile Anthony Kumi on his show. Exactly. But not the guy he referred to as being like a brother to him. Exactly. How awkward must that conversation have been? Do you think Joe even bothered to come up with an excuse about the Spotify deal and waiting a few months until he had the Austin studio up and running? Or did he just let Brian's calls go to voicemail? It's not just Joe either. Joey Diaz moved to New Jersey. Theo Vaughn is moving too. Without Callan to hold him back, Shaw is going to chase Rogan to Texas like afterbirth. That's funny. Because I was thinking, does Joe ever have his friends on to defend themselves when they're getting counseled? I think he did, didn't it? Wasn't he going to bat for Roseanne when she said, you know, uh, when she had another one of those episodes where she kind of uh, re reduced herself to saying the N-word in order to kind of get out her emotions? I'm pretty sure, right? She had Roseanne on. He had Roseanne on when she was going through her stuff. So... You can't even say, oh, I don't have my friends on when they're going through stuff because I want to protect them. It's really interesting. I'm really curious about that. I wonder why he didn't have him on. But again, you're not going to get an answer from Joe because Joe didn't even want to... Joe remember when Rogan didn't want to tell anybody about why he stopped streaming live? It was like something that he would refuse to comment about. I don't know why. Maybe because he didn't want to get a strike again. But that was really bizarre. He just, just should have come out and said, hey, we're not streaming anymore because we've got two strikes on our account. But I guess... Yeah, to be to be fair, he shouldn't have said that because if you say that, then you might get somebody. Somebody might try and hit your account, right? They might try and report stuff on purpose to get you another strike. So he just wanted to keep stum about it. But he's odd in that way. There's some things he just won't talk about at all. So this is probably one of them. The faction lines are already being drawn, and it will be very interesting to see how this all plays out in the coming months. And this is about where I was going to end the video before we got another unbelievable update to the story. On August 20th, a week after starting the Patreon for the Fighter in the Rings, Brian Callen posted a special message saying <laughs> forces beyond their control are preventing them from doing the Fighter in the Rings. Oh. Furthermore, Brian announced he was going to be doing two new podcasts, the first being a podcast debunking conspiracy theories with Sam Tripoli called Conspiracy Social Club, oh my and the God. second being the Callen Report, where Brian gives his hot takes on current events. Oh Real original, God. Bri. When I said earlier that Callan was doing the right-wing grifter routine, I didn't think he was going to rip off the most middle-of-the-road member of the intellectual dark web. Now we'll finally get to hear the unfiltered opinions of the man who thinks Candace Owens is a deep thinker, and got COVID on his first stand-up set after months of pretending the virus was a hoax. Actually, now that I think about it, I might have to listen to this podcast just for the unintentional hilarity of 
Big Brain Brian, pretending to be knowledgeable about politics because his dad was a CFR banker and he knows how to pronounce Afghanistan. <laughs> if he just learns how to drop some rap battle bars in my head top, this podcast will be complete. That being said, the news hasn't been so well received by the fans of The Fighter and the Kid. Almost every new episode of the podcast has been getting a 50-50 or worse like to dislike ratio Jesus and people Christ. are making their displeasure known. Wow. It seems like they finally realize they've been bamboozled. Callan and Schaub said they would be doing a new podcast and they got people to fork over $35,000 for one episode of The Fighter in the Rinks and a message from Brian saying they can't do the podcast anymore. I think Hanlon's razor is accurate in most situations, but it's rare to see somebody make so many bad decisions in such a short amount of time. Yeah, what's that Hanlon's razor? It's like never attribute malice to what can be attributed to stupidity or something, right? Um, look, man, I don't really agree with the thing, but I'm going to end it there because we're getting a bit too long in the tooth with the length, but you got the gist of it. I don't necessarily agree with the Patreon stuff. I don't think it's true that they're grifting or they kind of scam their fans. I think, if anything, the Patreon, the support on Patreon for Brian Callan or for the Fight in the Rinks is kind of the Fight in the Kids fans' way of kind of backing Brian because they believe his side of the story. They believe he didn't do it. They believe he's innocent. They believe these women are making up these stories so they're trying to show their support by monetarily um supporting him i guess and saying hey we don't believe this is true and if they're trying to cancel you here's some money so you're uncancelable um i guess the issue they have is that brian just what we basically proved is that even with the sex of fire and the kid he can't do this on his own he needs brendan right the, the, the reason why the the podcast was so great in the beginning was their dynamic was the fact that um brian was this amazing comedic genius with this wealth of experience doing improv and you know just years of stand-up and just being a really silly goose a really good silly goose and then you married it up with somebody like uh brendan Schub, who at the time was really funny in his own way right in his own kind of um jock sort of like um meathead way obviously he's changed now and maybe he's got to let the money and the success get to his head he's a bit of he's a bit up his own ass but part of the beauty of it was that they were they worked perfect together as a group as a tandem sorry uh brian came through with the creativity and the artistry and again brendan Schaub came through with some artistry in his own regard don't get me wrong but also mostly just had the business chops to kind of make sure that podcast was successful and now on his own Callan hasn't got a scooby he hasn't got a help in hell he, he used to turn up late to a podcast that was number one that i would assume was his main breadwinner that was the thing making him the most money. That was a show that was getting him the gigs and the opportunities and providing him with the cultural relevance that allowed him to still be out there doing auditions. And he was treating it like a second class thing. And it's quite, you know, again, sweet, uh, uh, what you call it? Uh, poetic justice that now the podcast that you were taking for granted, you're now not allowed to go back on because you signed your way of rights um, to another production company. But yeah, I don't think that's, that's true. Again, um, it's a funny thing, man. I think that's a great documentary. Again, I, I won't play the last four minutes. I already spoke for too long about this, but let me know what your thoughts are below in the comments. Um, do you agree with Bay's Frequencies POV? Uh, does it appear to be completely over for Brian Callan's Hollywood career? Do you think Brendan Schaub, do you think him and Brendan Schaub have a rift? Is there something going on there? Are they Have they fallen out behind the scenes that we're not aware of? Um, how do you explain Joe Rogan's silence? Does it make any sense to you? um let me know in the comments down below and again i'll put the link for the podcast or for the show the documentary itself in the description but i'm sure you've seen it already but it's from base frequency it's titled the brand Cat accusations and the end of the fire and the kid i'll put in the link down below but again thanks for watching make sure you like and subscribe and i'll see you again very very soon peace